You're about to meet uh, two ladies here with sort of remarkable stories. We've talked an awful lot in the abstract about poverty and what it means, what some of these neighborhoods look like. Uh, last week, Dr. Danny Avula really went in depth about uh, what his family was experiencing. He and his wife, when they moved to that inner city neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia, and his experiences. But coming at it from a much different place. I mean, at any given moment, uh, Dr. Danny could have picked up and left, and left for a quote-unquote better life. And of course, he stuck it out for the last decade, which is pretty remarkable. But as we've talked about in this series, so many people aren't given a choice. So many people aren't, don't have the options that perhaps many of us in this room do. And the two ladies who are here to share their stories tonight are going to go in depth about what poverty has really meant to them, how it has impacted them, and how they view it now. Because it's not abstract, and their stories are not abstract. They're very real. I'm going to introduce both of them before I bring up our first guest. Uh, let me talk about Tammy Hart, who's an executive assistant at Day and Zimmerman here in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, Tammy, his rise from poverty to success has been featured on Fox Carolina. It's been in the Greenville News and in the United Way 2013 campaign video. She is the recipient of the Mary Yo and H.L. Yo Junior Community Service Award given by Day and Zimmerman to an employee who models the company's commitment to building stronger communities. As a board member and former homeless guest of Greenville Area Interfaith Hospitality Network, she eagerly shares her story with others to bring awareness to the plight of homeless families and those who live in poverty. We'll hear from Tammy in just a second. Our first guest will be Dawn Dowden of Homes of Hope. She's the Vice President of Operations there. College educated, raised in a middle class family. Due to her husband's mental illness, Dawn and her three children experienced poverty and eventually homelessness. Over the past six years, Dawn and her three boys have risen out of poverty and homelessness to rejoin the middle class. Her experience fuels her work as the Vice President of Operations for Homes of Hope, a not-for-profit organization based here in Greenville that rebuilds communities and rebuilds lives all throughout our state. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ms. Dawn Dowden. Thank you so much for having me. I've got to get my timer set up here because I tend to talk a lot, especially about something that I'm very passionate about. Um, again, I am Dawn Dowden. I get the incredible opportunity and privilege daily to work as the Vice President of Operations for Homes of Hope. Just to quickly show you, um, those are my precious three boys. Um, those Caleb is 14 years old. He will be a freshman at Wade Hampton this fall, um, which is actually in a couple weeks, hard to believe. Um, Kai is my middle son. He will be starting middle school um, at Langston Charter Middle School. And Cody is my youngest, um, and he will be in second grade at Lake Forest Elementary School. Um, and again, as far as my opportunity, I work for an incredible organization called Homes of Hope. Homes of Hope, what we do is we rebuild communities through developing energy efficient, affordable housing. And we also rebuild the lives of men overcoming drug and alcohol addiction through job training and mentoring. Basically, the folks that we've been talking about for the last couple sessions, that's our job. That's what we get to do on a daily basis. The incredible opportunity that I have is all those folks that we work with, I was in their shoes. I can relate to them. And so it's a privilege for me that my experience led me to a place where now I get to impart my experience in my daily work. Life's good now. We live in a sweet little community in Taylor's. I actually met a couple that um, just a couple seconds ago that remembered when we moved into the community. We have a sweet little house with a bedroom with three bedrooms and a beautiful yard for my children to play in. And eight years ago, life didn't look like that. Eight years ago, my family and I were in poverty. What led us to poverty? Homes of Hope actually serves about 251 families throughout this state. Unlike a lot of the families we serve, I didn't grow up in poverty. I grew up in middle income, suburb, sweet little neighborhoods with the picket fences. And when we experienced mental illness, I met actually my high school sweetheart in that sweet little neighborhood. We got married, started a family, and about nine years into our marriage, he developed a mental illness. 
And that rocked our world. You know, we had, again, this sweet little family. It was, we were living the American dream, so to speak. And when mental illness hit our household, it really hit our household. Navigating mental illness is the most complicated thing I've ever experienced in addition to navigating the systems that are in place for those in poverty. When um, we actually went through the process of um, dealing with his mental illness, and of course, when the first diagnosis came, we thought, you know, something is just like any other illness. Take some medication, go to some doctor's appointments, and we'll be good. We'll be moving on. A couple years later, we realized that that was not the case. And a couple years later, it eventually robbed my husband of his mind, robbed him of his life, and robbed him of the family and hopes and dreams that we had expected to have. And we were now living in this world called poverty, navigating once again social systems that are impossible to navigate sometimes, don't make sense. And when you ask the questions, they say, please address me by my last name, Miss Jones. Don't call me by my first name. And you're a number. And that was so hard. We ended up at food banks where we once donated to. I ended up having spontaneous garage sales. I was the queen of spontaneous garage sales. If rent was due, hey, we've got a piece of furniture. Go ahead and put that out there. Let's see if we can go ahead and sell that. We ended up selling, I sold very precious family jewelry just to put food on the table. We walked places because we didn't have gas money. And again, all as a result of this disease called mental illness. All of that led us to, um, in 2008, the beginning of 2008, once my husband had really hit bottom in his mental illness, I became a single mom. Again, not the American dream, not what I expected. And a single mom, not only was I a single mom, but now as a single mom with three children that were homeless. Let me see. Those were those boys then. Cody was 15 months old, Kai was five, and Caleb was eight at the time. When I look back at those pictures, it's amazing. We actually entered into the GAIN program, um, just like Tammy, um, on February 6th, 2008. It happened to be my 34th birthday. We were now homeless guests in the GAIN program. And it's amazing looking back at those sweet little boys because they were homeless. We were homeless. Now I was a single mom in poverty, homeless, and I was unemployed on top of that. Great opportunity as far as being in this gain family was that you have all these folks fighting for you that don't even know your name, congregations that gave me birthday presents on my birthday when we entered the program, wonderful folks like Tony McDade, which probably doesn't want to shout out at this point in time, but is the executive director of gain who really had my back on things and gave us an opportunity to breathe. We stayed at 11 different churches and how staying at 11 different churches looked like is our um, rooms were Sunday school rooms with cots, little sweet little tables with little lamps and they made them so homey. And families loved on us that didn't even know us. It was the most amazing experience that I've ever ever had. And I run into people now and they'll say, oh, I remember you. And I'm thinking, I don't because I was so scared and I was in such survival mode. It was a little bit into that program that Tony came to me and I got my kids enrolled in school and we were trying to like move forward. And Tony came to me and said, remind me of your skill set again. And again, at that point, when you're in survival, you're in survival. You don't know what to do. And I didn't remember what my skill set was. I just needed a job. And at that point in time, he introduced me to an organization called Homes of Hope. And it was the only job I interviewed for. And I actually had a typo on my resume, which is pretty embarrassing looking back on it. Um, as I interviewed for that position, I was just looking for a job. The job now has become my calling. Because the people that walk in, the 251 families that we actually work with on a daily basis, that we build, again, beautiful housing for them. But housing is just a means to an end. The solution, there's hope. Hope for all the statistics that have been given. We help with that. 
We do budgeting, banking, building savings opportunities. We talk to them. We talk about dreams, questions that nobody has ever asked before. And so this incredible opportunity, Dr. Avula mentioned things like mixed income communities and those types of things. We can do that. Talked about you know, the systemic changes as well as the interpersonal changes. We do that. We work with families. We ask the questions, where do you see yourself in five years? Most have never been asked that question. And when you get asked that question, you kind of see some eyes you know, light up. What's a savings account? What's, a bank? what's, what's banking? Most folks are high still in, in the neighborhoods we work in are still hiding money underneath mattresses and in glove compartments because they don't trust the banks. We build trusting relationships with folks in the community. And again, I look at each one of those people that come in, lots of single moms, and actually out of the 251 homes we have, 59% approximately have children in those homes. Whoops. These sweet kids. These sweet kids, like my kids, that didn't have a choice. My kids didn't have a choice that they had a dad that had a mental illness and that they ended up homeless. These kids don't have a choice. They can't pick their parents. They grow up in these neighborhoods. These kids deserve the same type of home that my kids deserve. A home with a front porch, a yard, a place where they can ride their bike. I didn't want to raise my kids in an apartment complex, but at one time I thought that that was the only option. And so again, what turned into this mental illness, single parenting, poverty, this road that I walked actually led me to this amazing place that again, is, was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle, this transition. And every single one of us in the room has been given opportunity. We all have various opportunities, whether it's our teachers at school, whether it's a parent, whether it's the family we were born into, we've all been given opportunity. And that's what these children need. That's what their moms and dads need. They, single moms need to know that it's okay. You're going to be okay. There's hope. That's what they need. Hope and opportunity is a magical combination. That's what I was given by a bunch of people that didn't even know me. They gave me hope. They gave me opportunity. And that's why I'm standing here today. That's why my kids are where they are today. And I am so thankful for that. So thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. Like Dawn, I'm going to get my timer ready here. One second. Okay. I'm Tammy Hart. Um, I'm grateful to be here. And a lot of what Dawn said, I can't say any better. Tony, you know I'm going to call you out too again. Um, there are other people in here whose name I might mention as well. But, oh boy. My version of the American dream died when my relationship with poverty began. When I discovered I was pregnant in my freshman year at USC Columbia, I had to move back home, apply for Medicaid, food stamps, WIC, because a classmate of mine who had just had a daughter knew how to navigate the system. I'd never heard of the system. I didn't know anything about this because like Dawn, I grew up middle class. Of course, we had some issues in the family. My parents were divorced. There was some um, domestic violence um, going on, but I had no idea what food stamps were. I had no idea what WIC was. I didn't know about Medicaid. So when I went to DSS, I became intimate friends with the system for the next roughly 20 years. I wanted to leave poverty alone to break up with it, to sever the ties. But no matter how hard I tried, no matter what job I got, it wouldn't let go. You see, even though I had a high school education, I had some college under my belt, and I even graduated in the top 10 of my high school class, I couldn't find a job 
that paid more than $8.50 an hour. And you know, at $8.50 an hour, that is not enough to take care of three kids. Because five years later, I had two more children. I was living on my own. I was trying to pay the bills. Um, cars were breaking down. You know, expenses came up. Child care, which was a big thing. Even though there was, I think, an ABC program back then to help supplement child care, I still had to pay full price for child care um, in some cases, especially with people, and I think somebody mentioned this last week, when you try to find somebody to take care of your child and you can't afford it, you look for the neighborhood person. Um, somebody recommended a lady to me to um, babysit my youngest one. And um, I lost my job when she had to leave. She, she got, somebody in her family got sick and I couldn't find anybody else to take care of my son. So I was laid off from the only job I had at the time. So once again, the cycle began. I was also afraid to let go of poverty because I knew doing so would jeopardize my children's welfare because you have Medicaid. You can go to the doctor every year. They can go get their teeth cleaned. They can be taken care of. So basically, I'd become dependent upon the system. And as Don said, when you're dependent upon the system, the people look at you like a number. Every single caseworker I had but one looked at me as if I was just something to shoo here, do this, do that. Why'd you get pregnant? Why do you have these kids? That kind of thing. And I actually overheard one case, and I really want to say this, of people discussing somebody else's um, fertility. How can we keep her from having kids? Not me, but this was said right out there in the open. So needless to say, this was a difficult time for me. I had nobody to turn to. Navigating this system, navigating poverty was totally new. And I didn't make many friends living in the projects because I was different. Everybody knew I was different. I was not street smart. And so I was pretty naive in a lot of, in a lot of things um, that I tried to shield my kids from. Didn't necessarily protect them um, from seeing things that they should not have been exposed to. But as the chains of poverty got tighter and tighter, my hope that I would get out of the situation diminished. Our lowest point when we live in Donald, South Carolina, and I don't know if any of you ever heard of Donald's, but it's a small little hamlet, um, pretty much 20 to 25 minutes in the middle of, nope, you know, away from Abbeville and, 90, and Greenwood. And we had no car. I lived in a cinder block 1950s apartment that was under the Abbeville Housing Authority. And um, we had a metal screen door and there was a clothesline in the backyard. There was a corner store, maybe a quarter mile down the street, and we had um, a place called Angie's Grill, which was like the home, the cheeseburger house that we would go get food from whenever I could afford to. But it got to the point where when I, because I couldn't find a job, we ran out of food, even though I was on food stamps, because it was hard to make ends meet with just food stamps and $436 a month child support. So several times a month, we would have to gather change from around the house, go to the corner store, and grab Little Debbie cakes until the first of the month came along so we could find have something to eat. Now, I've never shared that with anybody, but that's how destitute we were. But sometimes it got to the point, I never contemplated suicide, but I always told, my, I always told myself, I'm not leaving my kids because they need me. And I really believe that Donald's wilderness situation, because that's how I saw it, something kicked in. And I said, I can't do this anymore. We've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. There was a brief detour in 96. I went back home because my lights went off in Donald's and I couldn't pay. Because I still had to pay rent. I had to pay light bill. I had to pay gas. And I moved back to 96 briefly into a 640 square foot home that was owned by my cousin. 
and it barely had running water. And um, I looked for a job because somebody had given me a car. Thank God. I looked for a job from November of 2005 until April, April 18th of 2006. I couldn't find anything. I knew people. That was my hometown. I knew Greenwood. Nothing. Nothing was going on. I said, I can't. This is it. I'm going. I'm moving to Greenville. I got up the next day and moved to Greenville on April 19th, 2006. And I told one person who was in here today, she's my good friend. I've known her for, for several years. She was the only person I told because I knew if I told anybody else, they would discourage me from going. But I knew I had to. I just had to get up and go. We came to the church we were living, we were um, attending because I would travel up here on Sundays, no matter what it took just to get to church. And the pastor there put us in touch with the Reverend Tony McDade of Cain. We got into the program. We went through the rotation. And as Don said, these people were awesome. I felt so good being around people who were encouraging. And I'm sorry. I didn't think I was going to cry and go over my time. But um, <laughs> I was so encouraged. And even two weeks after I moved up here, I got a job. I mean, two weeks. And I knew I had done the right thing. All of my kids were like, Mama, are you sure we're supposed to be doing this? Yes, we are. Because there was nothing else. I did not want them living like that. I didn't want them growing up in poverty. I wanted them to have op opportunities that I knew were there. So we were in the rotation for two months. We got into a tran transitional house. And... We stayed in that house for two years, even though it was supposed to have been one year, because we knew, because connections you make. You make these relationships with people that put you in the places you need to be when they see what's in you. And see, I knew there was something in me. It may have been that small and hidden by everything else, but other people saw it too. And once we moved up here and, got, and went through game, I found a job at Day and Zimmerman. I first met, met Dan Zimmerman, <laughs> met the company in 2007 as a temp. I came back in 2008 full time, then the bottom fell out and um, I was laid off. So I was, as I was laid off, what I did, instead of panicking, which is what I would have done before, I went back to school. I finished my psychology degree. And I lived off of the unemployment that I received for $350 a week. And back in, um, excuse me, <clears throat> in January of 2011, I was rehired full time at Day and Zimmerman. And speaking of, let me tell you about relationships and these people in my life who have helped me out. When I, my old boss called me to come back, I told her, I said, and I'm gonna tell, say her name too, Peggy Bassett. I said, Peggy, I don't have a car right now. I couldn't fix, my car broke down, I couldn't fix it. She said, well, let me see what we can do about that. She found somebody close by, a coworker, who picked me up every day and took me back and forth to work. And when I got to Dan Zimmerman, another lady who's here, and she will kill me if I say her name, but I am, Teresa Haskew, she helped groom me to become the executive assistant. I was working as a project aide. And because of Teresa's, commitment and what her seeing potential in me that I didn't even see in myself because I didn't think about being an executive assistant I was afraid anyway I was like is this really what I want to do you know because yeah <laughs> but Teresa saw that in me and she convinced the powers that be who are really supportive of me in everything I do even here and with United Way um, to hire me and that hiring put me in the middle class. That's where I am now. And I'm so thankful. And my kids have seen this. My kids have excelled. And that's why I did all of this. Forget about, forget about me. I did it for my children. Speaking of kids, that's my beautiful daughter. She's my oldest. She got her first job in 2008 at Staples. Stayed there for four years, moved up in the ranks. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> moved up in the ranks. Now she's working at Verizon and she's um, excelling in customer service. That is my oldest son, Rashad. He is my perfectionist, my philosopher, and my mechanic. <laughs> and <laughs> he just graduated from Greenville Tech with his um, associate in applied sciences in automotive. And that is my baby, Darian, who is celebrating a birthday today. He's 20 today. And um, he's my Gamecock cheerleader. 
But he's also mama's cheerleader because whenever I feel down, he's there with an arm around me. Oh, he'll just send me a text and say, mama, I love you. And he's a self-confessed mama's boy. He told me that today. He said, I don't care what you put on Facebook about me today. <laughs> he said, I'm a mama's boy. So those are the three reasons that I'm here. But I'm also here because I know other people are going through what I went through. And I want to bring them out. I want to show them there is a way out. You don't have to stay put. And as the doctor said last week, that one of the boys said, that's for you, but that's not for me. That's for everybody. You just have to be in relationship with the right people. You really have to believe it, and you have to be in relationship with the right people. And I'm sorry for going over, Mark, but I had to, I just, I, yeah, anyway. Thank you so much. <laughs> many, many thanks to both of you for coming up here and sharing those remarkable stories, because I know that that cannot be easy. Even though both of you are removed from poverty, I have to think uh, that for many years, it, I mean, for you especially, 20 years, the defining yeah. characteristic of your life that you had to carry around every single day. There was no escaping, as no. you mentioned, was there? No, no escaping. There, when you, um, I spoke at a forum about SNAP last year because when Governor Haley was um, thinking about changing, restricting even more what people can buy, um, I felt compelled to co go speak about that because when I was on food stamps, I, I wasn't happy. I wasn't waving the card around and say, oh, I can go to the store and get this and, you know, and buy this for free. There was nothing free about it. You felt, I felt ashamed because I knew I could do better. I could, and I was better. And I knew my kids, it's not something you brag about. So yeah, that, to carry that around and to be constantly in survival mode. Don knows what I, yeah, you, it's, it's every day. And I was um, telling someone backstage that really, I did. I haven't. I didn't feel comfortable until earlier this year. So it finally dawned on me that I can breathe. I really. It really dawned on me that I can breathe now. Of course, there are middle class things to deal with, but you know, <laughs> um, it's not like it used to be. I'm living in a three bedroom, two bath townhome in a gated community, thanks to some good friends. And once again, it's relationships. It's relationships, and these people are great to me. So we're good, we're good, but I'm gonna get even better. I know, you know, speaking just from a very personal experience and what it might do to you internally, you know, if you were just alone, would be rough enough, but both of you, I mean, I'm a parent, I know how much I worry about my children. We don't have near the problems to think about that the, the, the two of you went through. And Dawn, I would have to think that, looking at those three precious boys, knowing that this wasn't what you had planned and intended, uh, must have been beyond comprehension to you at that time to look at them and know we are facing a really, really hard time. It really was. And from the perspective of, um, you know, actually when we first entered the AIM program, um, there was an interview and, you know, and actually I was asked the question, you know, how long have you been homeless? And it was at that moment where I was like, we're, we're homeless. My children me were homeless and actually the real definition of homelessness as far as being doubled up we had been homeless for a long time we had had mm -hmm. to stay with family members and that type of a thing because we couldn't pay the bills and so multiple family members and um it was interesting now because my children will be walking through the store and my children will go hey mom remember when we were homeless <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's an interesting thing because, you know, they, it's just something normal to them, you know, because it was part of their life. And I look back and it was really hard and I felt like a failure as a mom um, because I didn't protect them and I didn't do what they needed me to do. But programs that are out there like GAIN, when we were staying at the churches, I'm thinking we're living in church, you know, mm -hmm. we're, and again, depending on the church, you know, sometimes we were, they had showers, sometimes they didn't have showers and I'm washing my kids in sinks and doing things that I'd never anticipated to do. But the highlight for my kids is we were living in a place that had a basketball court, you know, and it was like, this is awesome. <laughs> this is really awesome that, you know, we can go play basketball. And so I have to say, people ask me the question, you know, how did your kids make it through homelessness? And 
they did because that's what they knew. And mm-hmm. they got to experience, though, a bunch of amazing people mm-hmm. that loved on them. And my oldest son, even is when he was at Langston Charter Middle, was actually collecting things for the game program and would say and tell his classmates, you know, we were homeless. And this is why this is important to me. It's remarkable. The kids are remarkably resilient. And this is tangential almost in a way to the issue of poverty, but you bring up your your husband, mental health. And what we know about mental health in South Carolina is that it's not supported by the state to a large degree, that many of the programs used to support people with mental illness have been cut back drastically to the point that the majority of homeless where I live in Columbia, over 60% have some sort of mental illness. Uh, Our emergency rooms in Columbia are filled with people with mental illness. Our prisons, upwards of 30, 35% of those folks with mental illness. When you get caught up in that system, that's also can be a dispiriting one-way ticket to a bad place. You probably didn't know that at the time, I'm sure, did you? We didn't. And, you know, navigating, once again, you know, when we when he was diagnosed with the illness, he was diagnosed with schizoaffective bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. And when he was diagnosed with the illness, you know, again, I handled it like, you know, anybody else would handle it. It was like, okay, who do we need to talk to? What are the doctors we need to talk to? And again, next to the social service system, the mental health system, there's a lot of dedicated workers, but the system itself is maddening to a degree. And for folks that actually have an illness, I didn't have the illness. And I was struggling to navigate who we were supposed to talk to and you know what programs were available. He couldn't work. He ended up on disability because he couldn't work. Wonderful folks, Jane Crisp, I don't know where you are. She's in the audience. Um, she worked for Mental Health America at the time and helped me find housing for him. Um, but it is, I mean, it's it's very disappointing that there are a lot of folks that are dealing with mental health issues and are not getting the support. I mean, our typical, most our insurances will only cover a certain number of visits. Even if you have good insurance. Exactly. And let, and, and again, you know, and there's so many folks in the system. And so it's definitely something, you know, and I, I stand from a different perspective as a mom that saw her three boys watch their dad go through mental health issues. There's very little support f- out there for family members. Mm-hmm. Um, there's great organizations like NAMI and some of those others, but specifically to help the children actually navigate through, what am I seeing? Because you can't explain to a kid, daddy's sick. Well, daddy doesn't look sick. Right. So how, you know, how am I supposed to, he's saying weird things, but he doesn't look sick Mm -hmm. and it's just, there's not the services available for the kids or for, to catch the illness at an earlier stage in childhood and those types of things. So absolutely there needs to be some reform in that area. Timmy, I'm curious if you sat here over the past couple of weeks listening to the presenters, listening to the stories, seeing some of the data up on the screen, having lived this life you know, for 20 years, as you mentioned, what has resonated most with you over the past few weeks as you've sat here in the audience and, and taken some of this in? What really resonated with me, especially after listening to last week's, was the importance of relationships with people from all walks of life. If I didn't have people who were different than I am from um, different socioeconomic levels, I wouldn't be here today. I needed people who had basically built, who built bridges to help me cross. They didn't stand there on one side and say, come here. They went and got me and pulled me over. And that's what we need. That's what we need. We need, you need to look at these people and say, oh, they're just like me. I could be there. But for the grace of God, they're gone. You know, it's, and I was, I can't really say that I've always thought that way. I didn't think that way until I was in it because I was so far removed from it growing up. I mean, yeah, I knew people, you know, I was grew up in the 70s and 80s. And like I said, with even with the domestic violence, that was, you know, contained in the house. Everybody, the family knew, the cops knew, you know, but it was such a small town. Oh, you know, that's just how it is, you know, and how things were back then. But once I got out there to see how the world was, it was vastly, vastly different than I thought. So, you know, in some ways, I lived a sheltered life. I really and truly did. Surrounded by family, 
on like a big farm kind of area. I mean, in 96, my God, it's just so small. And you, everybody knows everybody. <laughs> You're related to everybody, too. But, um, <laughs> so, but yes, when I got out and got into the system and get, got into the, the projects or where even I've lived in some places that were not projects, but I actually, that was one of the first places we lived. So, and where we kind of eventually wound up before um, moving back to 96, but it's relationships. And not just a pat on the back and say, oh, or give me a handout. Don't pity me, because if you're pitying me, you're not doing anything for me. I don't want your pity. Just listen. Ask what I need. You know, get, don't even ask what I need. Just ask me, oh, how are you doing? What's going on? You know? Um, wow, how are your kids? That kind of thing. Develop a rapport. And that's how I got the things that I needed. People who learned about me and my family. We started, we connected. And giving you a sense of being whole again, yes. perhaps. Yes, you know, Many yes. of the people that I talk to in, in this situation over the years, you know, one common theme that comes up is, they will say, well, Mark, you know, they, people just don't look at you as if you're a real person. Yes. Or they'll yeah. avert their eyes because mm -hmm. Lord knows we don't want to see, you know, poor people. That's not a good yes. thing. Yes, yes. Uh, to the extent even there's a church in Davidson up in North Carolina who's a pastor there from this Lutheran church who commissioned a statue of what looks like a homeless man laying on a park bench. It's actually Jesus underneath oh. a blanket. Complete out uproar in that town. They wanted it removed. All right, with homeless people in the streets of Davidson. This is a nice community. But there is that sense among many people that we just don't really want to see. Mm -hmm. Because if we do, we look hard enough, it's just as painful as us as it is to you, don't you think? You know, I think um, when my kids started, you know, their schooling, um, and we would sit down at, you know, parent-teacher conferences and all those other types of things. Um, and when we started in the school system, we were, you know, the homeless family. I mean, they were really nice to us, but they all knew. We started in the middle of the school year. They all knew. Um, they had been gracious and given us school supplies and those types of things. But it was that, you know, and then they later found out that we had mental illness because, mm. you know, at that point, their daddy was still in the picture kind of, sort of, and he would come to some different things, but he was the dad with mental illness. And it is that, you know, I'm not going to go too far. You know, I'm not going to ask too many questions because it is, it's, it, it is a hard thing. It's actually, you know, we see it in our work at Homes of Hope all the time that, um, you know, the, those people will take people on tours of the neighborhoods in our, in the community and West Greenville, which is one of the communities that we've actually put 110 single family homes, beautiful homes in West Greenville. And a very first, if you guys remember, you know, the very first session we had, it's one of the highest poverty areas in Greenville in the Greenville area. And when we take folks on those tours, it is the doors quickly lock you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, because it is hard to see. It's hard to see kids, you know, living, you know, in in tough, you know, areas. And again, we've done 110 units in that neighborhood. There is still so much work that needs to be done in that community. And so it is, but, but I believe, you know, my experience, I believe Tammy's experience, I believe, you know, the work of, there's a lot of different agencies represented here is to bridge that gap, mm -hmm. is to show that, you know, we are all the same. Again, folks have just been born into different circumstances than you've been. But if you were born in that circumstance, you'd be in the same place. And the children, you know, again, just because a child's in poverty, you know, some of the statistics and some of the things that were going, you know, said last session as far as, you know, food food challenges and those types of things you know and again there is there are those things there but something we like to say at homes of hope is just because somebody's in poverty doesn't mean they know they don't know jesus and they don't know jack um <laughs> i didn't coin that myself our president and ceo did but again for the folks that come and we often you know do tours it is just that you know well, we've got to make sure we share the gospel. And it's kind of like, okay, yes, that's a good thing. And that is part, we are a faith-based organization. But there's some of those folks that grow up in that community or that live in that community that live by faith way more yes. than we yes. do. And yes. that actually do know how to really make a $200, you know, you know, food stamp snap, you know, last not with necessarily just processed foods, but with other types of things. So it is hard. It's definitely hard for 
folks to look at and see the reality. We have a roving microphone uh, in the room. So if anybody uh, in the audience would like to ask a question of one of our panelists here today, or maybe both panelists, if you've got a comment, question, then please raise your hand. There's a gentleman over here. at Homes of Hope and, and concluded that providing housing is a real important ingredient in helping people. Well, it's, well it depends because sometimes as far as how it's defined, Housing First typically throughout the country is defined specifically serving folks, taking folks right off the streets and moving them into housing. Organizationally, that's not something we do. One of our strategies is we're a permanent housing solution for homeless service pro providers. So folks like you know myself and like Tammy that come out of the GAIN program, we actually, once you know folks go through transitional housing and have a level of stability, we help provide that permanent housing solution. We do we're partner with Safe Harbor, lots of organizations like that. But again, there's other agencies in the area that do have a more operate on that model but the foundation is whether whether housing really does make a difference you know we do we're actually working on this long-term kind of impact report of like what does it really do for a kid that grows up in quality energy efficient affordable housing and the trajectory does it change it at all now that's a, a path that we're starting to really measure more but think about it on a daily basis if you know a little girl grows up in a house that is has holes in the floors, has holes in the walls, has water dripping from the ceiling, and this really happens. We have folks that come in all the time, mildew throughout the house, just horrible situations, and you put that same little girl in a 1,100 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, newly constructed home that's energy efficient, mom can afford it. I mean, you get the picture. It makes outlook on life look different. So we're working on all the statistics, but as a mama of three, I can't help but say absolutely housing makes a huge difference. Anyone else in the audience have a question? Okay. Um, I I think I'm asking for advice as far as um, kind of the going across the bridge is concerned. Um, my and I'm gonna try and stay composed. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, my dad is a pastor in an area um, that is fairly low income. Uh, we're in Florence, South Carolina. And um, he's been there for probably maybe about 17 years now. Um, and I've been teaching Sunday school since I was, I don't know, like 12. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was there before some of these kids were even born. Um, and then we had some new ones come in. And so we're at the middle school and the high school age right now. Um, and over the years that some of these families have uh, been in the church, they've kind of risen to um, a higher standard of living, I guess you could say. So the kids are not, not all of them are in poverty, so to speak. Some of them are, and you've got the situation with grandma, and she's got her kids, and then her kids' kids, and you know, there's 13 of them in the house, and two bedrooms, and, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm struggling right now because um, the, the kids, their influences um, are not solely church. And church is just once a week. And the people who are there are so much older than them that there's no connection. And so a lot of their influence is their cousins who are hanging out in the ghettos with all these other kids and whatever it is they run into in public school, which I don't even want to talk about. Um, and, and I'm at school in Greenville, so I can't be there mm. to be their Sunday school teacher like I used to be. Um, and um, I'm watching the kids slip. And, 
and I don't um I don't know how to tell the parents. Um because the parents are rising out of poverty mm-hmm. and I'm watching the kids sink mm-hmm. into that mindset. And I don't know how to shake the parents awake. The parents don't want to see it. That's what I think. I I well, tried. What do you do? With the parents? That's a difficult question. With the kids, if you were there, I don't, is there anybody who can fill the gap while you're not there? Because when I was in a similar situation, my kids thankfully never got involved with drugs. They never got involved with sex. They never did those things, even though it was there, because I kept telling them, no, we're not going there. We're not doing that. You're not doing this while you're living with me. When you move out of your own, you can do what you want to do. But that's when, when you can take responsibility for having a child or for you know, going to jail or whatever the case may be, when you can do that, then you're free to do what you want to do, but not while you're in my house. But it's, what happened with me in the church, and um, we kind of had a similar situation. When I was living in a place called Pine Tree in Greenwood, which is probably way more low income now than it was 15 years ago. There was a pastor, an associate pastor, um, who came around, you know, knocking on the doors and trying to get people to come to Jesus. Um, But his timing was great for me because I needed that. And what they did, and he's an older gentleman, he had no young kids, him and his wife and his daughter. They came to take us to church every Sunday, bought bought me clothes to wear, we got to know them, and we developed a relationship with them. And my kids, they he would take the boys because their fathers could have cared less, you know. Um, took the boys places and did things with them so they could have a positive role model. And um, and my father, you know, he he's he was in their life too, but not as much as you know. Hey, he couldn't. He was the grandfather. He has a job, you know, has a work, and he has his own life. But um, I was fortunate in that, but I know what you mean by the parents in the neighborhood because some of my friends in the neighborhood, their kids were different than mine, but they did not lay down the law as I did. And I was, like I said, I was fortunate my kids listened to me because, you know, children do what they are want to do. But um, <laughs> they, I think really what happened too with my kids is because I instilled in them that they were not their situation. Mm-hmm. And I kept telling them that because I knew deep down your circumstances do not define who you are. And I made sure to tell them that and I had to tell myself that or else I would not be here in front of you. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to answer your question, but you need to talk to those parents. I mean, you have to be straight up with them and say, look, this is what your kids are doing. And you have you you snatch them out now or it's going to get worse. That's the only advice I can give you because I'm trying to be pretty blunt with the people I know in my life now. There was a time when I wasn't, but now I am. And you really have to do that. Is it, when's the next time you're gonna see these people? Hopefully Sunday. (laughs) Okay, well, you know, you can do that. I had a pastor who did that once. It was not in the right way, but um, (laughs) he, um, because it offended me because my child was crying in church. He was two. That's what happens with two-year-olds and you don't have a nursery. But. but it was kind of a jab at a single parent because, you know, but that's okay. That's what you felt you had to do. But if I were you, I would address, if you have to address the whole church, address the whole church. You do what it takes to save these kids. That's, and, you know, you be that bridge builder. And I thank someone for sending me that poem. Um, is a poem called The Bridge Builder by Will Allen Drumgull. I think that's the name. And it's a beautiful poem. And if you can find it, look it up. And I promise you, it's going to make you cry and it's going to inspire you to be that person for those children. Okay. Terrific advice there. <laughs> for saying you did not have any advice, you had plenty of advice <laughs> right there. That really was fantastic. Is there anybody else in the audience with a question for the ladies here? If not, uh, yes, sir. involved in a, a program called Support Circle that's right here where we're working with people 
She has a full-time job. She had to have some dental work done, made the mistake of purchasing some furniture. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the financials behind this are just ridiculous. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. she has dental insurance at work, but she still has, sorry, this mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's predatory type, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. uh, interest-free for 12 months, but then if you don't pay it off at the end of 12 months, you know, it's like 28% interest rate, and it goes back to the beginning of the loan and this sort of thing, and these companies are, are just taking advantage of the people in this situation. P you know, cash checking services, mm -hmm. ridiculous mm -hmm. fees. The question is, uh, is there anything we can do about that? Uh, is there anything anybody is, I guess it's a legal issue, it's a business mm -hmm. issue. Is there anything you can do about that? Um, you know, the issue of difference. predatory lending has come up from time to time in the last five years here in South Carolina. Um, yeah, yeah, in many neighborhoods where, where you drive past, you know, those are the storefronts, you know, one right after another. Financial literacy, you know, in these communities is a very tough issue because, let's face it, if you haven't grown up with any money, if you've never been able to manage any money, mm -hmm. how do you have any, you know, financial literacy at all? Yeah. Uh, you know, that would say, many people would seem to insinuate that that's easy prey for people like he's referring to, predatory lending. Well, something at Hems of Hope, we like to call it financial wellness. Again, it's kind of gets back to that don't know Jesus, don't know Jack, you know, type thing is, you know, again, we can't just assume because somebody's in poverty that they're not financially literate, mm -hmm. but we can all improve in our financial wellness. And out of the 250 families, you know, that we work with, you know, again, when you're in survival mode and you've had all of these situations come up, you don't have good credit. You cannot just go to, you know, like, you know, a middle income person and go and buy a car. And so you have to, you know, you end up prey to these, you know, predatory lenders. And those are the things that organizationally we, again, go beyond the housing for us, you know, budgeting banking, building savings, looking at these, you know, types of things. We actually had one of our clients that was paying, I think it was $400 every two weeks for a, I think it was like a 2008 mm. car. Mm. And again, in her mind, she didn't think she needed a car and she didn't and she couldn't go get a car. There's wonderful organizations. Community Works Carolina actually offers a program that will actually help pay off those predatory lending um, uh, loans mm -hmm. and actually help folks because, again, it just continues the cycle of poverty. Mm -hmm. And and it is something, I mean, from a from – Christmas time, all those types of things where, hey, get your check cashed here. We even have a lot of folks um, that we've had to, you know, have to, t to tell, you don't have to pay your bills by money order. Yeah. Right. I mean, and actually count up. You're you know, actually a spending. A piece, right? Right. $75 yeah. a year, which could go partly towards your electric bill that you're paying, not to mention gas, to go around and pay, and pay that. So financial wellness is a huge issue for us as an organization. And it's a huge issue as far as, you know, breaking that cycle of poverty. Yeah. Well, ladies, once again, thank you so much for taking time to share your remarkable story. Thank you. <laughs> Very tremendous. An awful lot of bravery there, too. I mean, both of you women, you know, very brave, you know, single moms with some beautiful kids who've all turned out and turning out great. So many congratulations to both of you. And we'll wrap up the series next week with a good conversation about the city of Spartanburg. For those of you not familiar with uh, downtown Spartanburg for many years, like many other cities, uh, was victim uh, of decay and over the years had not looked like its old self back in its heyday, the 50s and 60s. And what has happened there in terms of revitalization means a lot of people have come together. You get universities, hospitals, community groups, faith groups have come together to work together to make that a vibrant whole place again. And it's working. It's a really neat success story and one that I think you'll love to hear. We'll also hear from the recently retired CEO and chairman of Costco. Many of you shop there. They pay their employees a little bit more than most places in the service industry, uh, quite a bit more as a matter 
matter of fact. And we've heard some people say, well, that's bad for business. It's going to lay people off. Well, they have taken this on as a, to be a business virtue. How is it working out for them? How has it affected their sales? How has it affected their clientele? He's a great story, and he'll be here with us to wrap things up next week, same time, same place, right here at the Yount Center. Thank you for coming.